Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I, 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 and I, I have to say, I, uh, I, I appreciate the uh, short, plain introduction. Because, I mean, standing back there, I was just thinking of something that Warren Buffett likes to say. He says, what's the most important quality in a spouse? Intelligence, sense of humor? No, he says. Low expectations. <laughs> Uh, the, the later laugh always comes from the people who've been married the longest. Uh, fine. They know he's not right. So, look, our topic is winning in a friction-free world. This is something we're going to be hearing a lot more about. And I'll explain what this means, but I suspect you already have a pretty good idea of what this means. The important thing to keep in mind is that it applies to every company in every industry, and not just the digital companies that we might so easily think of. It applies to every one of us. This is a Tesla Model S. A few years ago, Tesla was dealing with a problem that car makers really don't like, which is cars bursting into flames. <laughs> this, is, this is never a good thing, okay? This is, this is just never a good thing. And what this happened in Washington State, and two weeks after that, it happened on a highway in Tennessee. And at that point, the federal investigators opened an investigation, and we all know what happens next. They do their investigation, they figure out what went wrong, then they order a recall, and lots and lots of cars have to go back and get fixed, and it's a big hit to the reputation of the company, and it costs many, many millions of dollars. Except that none of that happened in this case. It turns out that when that car is going at highway speed, it automatically lowers the front of the chassis a little bit to make it more aerodynamic. And when it was in that position, if it ran over a little bit of metal, a bolt or something on the road, and it kicked up in just the wrong way, it would hit the battery pack, which of course is across the bottom of the vehicle and that's what would start the fire. Well, once they figured this out, Tesla beamed a software update through the cell network overnight to all the affected cars, raising the chassis at highway speed by an inch. Once they did it, the problem went away. Two months after they opened the investigation, the federal investigators closed it, and there was no recall. Tesla used the cell network and software to avoid any need for a recall. They didn't have to move all those cars back to dealerships. And of course, they don't have dealerships anyway. They have showrooms where you can go drive the cars, but then you go to your computer and you configure your car the way you want it. So you don't have to have big lots full of cars sitting around. And of course, the electric motor technology is just fundamentally simpler than internal combustion technology. So they can make these cars with fewer people and less capital than you would otherwise need. So you put that all together, here's what you get. The big incumbent manufacturers, on average, are creating about $1.40 of market value for every dollar of physical assets they've got. Tesla's creating a little over $9 of market value per dollar of physical assets. The big incumbents, on average, are creating about $220,000 of market value per employee. Tesla's creating about $1.8 million of market value per employee. 
You don't get differences like that by being more efficient. You get them by fundamentally reconceiving the business for a friction-free economy. The larger point is that the friction-free economy is here. It's been talked about for a long time. It's been talked about actually for 20, 25 years. And it made slow progress for a long time, but it's getting faster every day. And at this point, it's making progress by enormous strides every week. It's getting so big and important that it's affecting every one of our businesses. And yeah, that's, you can do your taxes on your phone now. Labor, information, and money move easily, cheaply, and almost instantly in a friction-free economy. Now, of course, information has moved that way for a long time, money has moved easily and cheaply and almost instantly for a while. But labor, that's different. It has never moved easily, cheaply, and instantly. But now, of course, there have been these online marketplaces where you can get all kinds of jobs done easily, quickly, almost instantly. So easy you can't believe it. But it was always pretty low-level work. And now that's changing. So this is the website of an outfit called Hourly Nerd, where you can go and essentially rent the alumni of the great consulting firms, graduates of the best business schools in the world. You can hire temp strategic planners or financial analysts. Some companies have rented CFOs through this outfit. And while most of the customers are small and medium-sized companies, some huge companies use them as well. This company has given its services to Microsoft, General Electric. All of these things, including labor, can now be moved quickly, easily, cheaply. Things change. Companies form new relationships with customers, workers, and owners. This is an Amazon Dash button. It's about three inches long, has adhesive backing, so you can stick it up wherever you like. So you'd stick this one on the wall of your laundry room. And once you've got it configured, when you see you're running low on detergent, you hit that button. Two days later, got a box of Tide on your doorstep. All right. When this was introduced, the general consensus was, this is the dumbest idea of all time, all right? An internet-connected device that does one thing. It orders more Tide. That's it, okay? There are now hundreds of these things. Every brand wants one of these from Amazon, and so now you can order computer paper, you can order dog food, you can order anything you can think of. The important thing, the larger point to remember is, a large part of Amazon's success, in fact, has come from the fact that they obsess over taking friction out, okay? That's what they do. After all, this is from the company that invented and patented one-click buying, right? And yet somebody over there got to thinking, you know, that one-click buying, it's just too hard, right? <laughs> it, you, you, you gotta get online, you gotta find the product, you gotta move the cursor over <laughs> and click, you know? It's just too much trouble. And so they came up with this. And it is growing incredibly fast. And the manager of this program says, our goal is to make shopping invisible. Taking friction out is what they do. Other things change. Companies rethink the role of capital. This is Tim Cook at a Foxconn factory in China. 
We often forget that unlike Facebook and Google and Microsoft, Apple makes its money by selling physical products that are its own. But it doesn't make any of them, of course. Foxconn makes them mostly in China. It wouldn't be possible to do this without digital technology that lets them coordinate the incredibly complex global supply chain they need to assemble these phones in China and get them wherever they're needed when they need to be there. And as a result, Apple has been able to create an $800 billion market cap with much less capital than any comparable company could ever have hoped to do. Other things, companies create value in new ways. How, how many people know what this is here? Candy Crush Saga. Yeah, several hands. How many people don't know what this is? A lot of you. How many people claim not to know what this is? <laughs> All right. Candy Crush is a game. This is a game you can download onto your phone or tablet, get it for free. Costs nothing to download. You can play it all you want for free. Now, you may say, how is that a business? It's all free. Well, like many of these games, you're always trying to get to a higher level, and each level is more difficult than the last. And so if you get stuck and it just, you just can't get to that next level, you can buy extra lives and levels. And of course, they have no meaning outside the framework of the game, but you buy them with real money. And it's really easy. You just hit a button. OK. Now, the company that makes Candy Crush went public a few years ago, so they had to publish their financials. And that's when we learned that people were spending $4.1 million a day buying lives and levels on Candy Crush. What's the larger, the point is, if someone had come to any of us and said, I've got this great idea for a business, what would we have said? We would have said that's the stupidest idea for a business I ever heard. After a few years as a public company, this company was sold recently to one of the giant gaming companies for $5.9 billion. Okay. Revolution in friction-free capital light business models. This is a larger aspect of this whole thing. It is often observed with wonder. Alibaba Group, by volume, the largest retailer in the world, holds no inventory. Airbnb, now the largest provider of accommodation in the world, has no rooms. Uber, world's largest car service, has no cars. All of these companies have become incredibly valuable and successful by putting buyers and sellers together. Those buyers and sellers were always there, and they always would have liked being put together but it was just too hard. There was too much friction. What these companies did was find ingenious ways to take the friction out. And now those buyers and sellers that were always out there can find each other. And the amount of value created is enormous. In fact, McKinsey Global Institute says the most profitable industries today, in general, are asset light. A lot of things happen in this world that didn't used to happen, some of them strange. For example, new business models reapportion value. This is a Skype screen. In 2013, some consultants figured out that Skype had taken away from the world's telecom companies about $37 billion of revenue because people could make free or low-cost calls on Skype. So I thought, that's interesting. I wonder how much revenue Skype itself took in in that same year. So I looked it up. Answer, 
$3 billion. Okay, $37 billion out of the global telecoms because of Skype, $3 billion into Skype. What happened to the rest of it? It went to customers in the form of greater value. And this is happening in many industries as well. Corporate lifespans are getting shorter. Friction was protection. Companies didn't know they could get a better deal someplace else, or it was too much trouble to make the switch, or the transaction cost was too high. All of that friction is coming out. The protection is dropping away. Corporate lifespans are getting shorter. Sounds like a kind of a dark outlook for companies, but there's another trend. The winners are winning bigger than ever. There is a winner-take-all pattern developing in many industries, so the winners are winning bigger than ever. I happened to look recently on a recent date, March 31st of this year, the US Treasury had $92 billion of cash and marketable securities on hand. On that same day, Apple had 257 billion of, of cash and marketable securities on hand, okay? Some companies are having a hard time, but others are achieving the scale of nations. This is unprecedented, which leads to a really large question. Why do companies even exist? Because in the world of theory, the economy spins like a top and there is no need for big companies. So why do they exist? Well, an English economist named Ronald Coase won a Nobel Prize for answering this question. He said they exist because to do a business, you know, there are agreements that have to be negotiated, inspections that have to be made, uh, disputes that have to be resolved. And the most efficient way to handle these things is to house them all within a corporation. That's why big companies exist. But of course, all those things that he was talking about are friction. And friction is coming out of every part of the economy. And so it's no longer necessary to house those functions in companies. Companies are able to unbundle themselves and we are seeing it happening already. The new model may be increasingly a kind of continuous Hollywood model, where people and entities come together to accomplish a particular project or goal, and when it's over, they disperse to go do other things. It is happening already. The big message that comes out of all of this is great news. It is that every organization and every person can possess the 21st century's most valuable assets, openness to new ideas, ingenuity, and imagination. The thing about friction coming out is that it lowers barriers of all kinds. Friction is barriers. When friction comes out, the barriers come down. A lot of companies will see that as a threat. And it may be a threat. Competitors can come out of nowhere. Companies you never thought of as competitors can suddenly show up. But the best companies, the most successful companies, will see it as a huge opportunity because they can be that competitor who comes out of nowhere. That's why a friction-free economy is, bottom line, more opportunity than ever in history. And so my plea to you is, seize it. It's an honor to talk with you about these things. Thanks, everybody. Joining Jeff Colvin on stage is the host of AutoLine, John McElroy.
Jeff, great presentation. Very interesting here. So let's get right into some of the questions that yes. you generated, in my, at least in my mind. Yes, please. Uh, this hourly nerd thing, very yeah. interesting. Labor now moves quickly. Yeah. How far do you think this might go? Well, I'll tell you how far. I mean, John Chambers, who was the CEO of Cisco, said a lot, made a lot of crazy predictions in his life. But the trouble is, a lot of them came true. <laughs> and not too long ago, he said, the day is coming when huge companies will have only two employees, the CEO and the CIO, the chief information officer. Everything else, he said, is going to be outsourced. Now, like I say, that going that far sounds crazy. The trouble is he has a history of being right about it. And so I, there's no telling how far it can go, but it, it will be pressed to that point. There will be institutions that try to do that. My background and knowing what's going on is all automotive. Yes. Automotive, massive capital investment. Yes. Years to develop products that then themselves will be in production for years. How do you see this impacting them of getting a corporation down to only two people? <laughs> well, okay, it'll be hard, but you know, this really comes down to a question of who is going to own the capital. That's really all it comes down to. And it may be that, I'm, so what are the elements? You know, what, somebody has to own the capital for producing these things. And you know, look, they're big physical things. It's gonna take a lot of capital to make the metal and then make the vehicles and so forth. Somebody has to have the capital. Somebody has to own the brand and somebody has to do the strategizing. Well, we never imagined that those would not all be within one organization. But the truth is they don't have to be. And so we may see them unbundled. And it may be that the entity that owns the capital may not be the most valuable entity, that owns you know, the, the, the manufacturing, may not be the most valuable entity of those Three, although it may also be that the one that owns the heavy capital, the high capital, will specialize in that and will get really, really good at it. It's a completely different structure, but at the rate things are going, we really have to think about it. It's really interesting how successful Apple has been. Only designing products, right. contract, all the manufacturing to Foxconn, right. which is a company that with um, over a million employees. I believe right. it's the, the largest employer in the world of any corporation. What if Foxconn decides, you know what? We have learned so much working with Apple, we're gonna come out with our own phone or our own iPad. Right. That has not happened. Right. How has Apple protected itself from that happening and how might others protect themselves if they wanna borrow this kind of model? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a really good question because how Apple has done it is something that re really demands our attention. Um, they've done it in part simply by being extremely secretive about what they do. They have done it in part by focusing on elements of the experience that others haven't focused on. In other words, the design of the product, uh, th their ability to imbue it with a certain coolness, and above all, what distinguishes Apple, in my view, is they create the overall customer experience as one integrated whole. And every company wants to do that. Very few companies actually do it. Everything about an Apple product, the design of the hardware, the software, the online uh, experience, even the packaging, it is all designed to go together. Somebody, and it used to be Steve Jobs, took the role of the integrator, this person who would oversee the whole customer experience creation. Most companies don't have anybody in that role. 
of the integrator who oversees every part of the, cr the creation of the experience. Apple did that and still does it, and other companies are on to it, but Apple is still the best in the world. You've described, I think, very accurately, too, how we're seeing friction coming out of commerce, out of yes. business. Yeah. What about politics? I mean, that's really what this <laughs> conference is all about. Yeah. And I would say the political system as we have it right now in the United States is the definition of friction. Yeah, absolutely. Politics may be the only industry in which technology increases friction, actually. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't know, I don't see tweeting actually doing anybody any good so far. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it should take friction out, except that politics long ago reached the point where the, the friction is, I think, 100% human, right? It, it's, it, it's not susceptible to, to this anymore. Uh, but also when I said it, it's the only business where technology has increased friction, I wasn't really kidding. What I mean is, it does, the technology enables people to get information from sources that are not always reliable or correct or accurate. You, you can call it fake news. But yes, well, it is fake. There, well, there clearly is fake news in some cases. Um, and for a long time, that wasn't really possible. It didn't go back forever, but let's say for the 50 years after World War II, media were kind of concentrated. Everybody was getting a similar view. Not the same, but at least a similar view of the world. That's, of course, completely fractured now. You talked a lot about the friction that's coming out of the economy. Yeah. Take us down the road a bit in your vision of where things are going. Whether you want to go out a decade or two, yeah. where do you see this friction-free economy taking us? Uh, I, I see it taking us fundamentally to a world in which changes happen much faster. And so we saw that chart of the declining lifespan of corporations. I would expect that to continue. And in fact, we may even see new forms of enterprises uh, created because it, all the different elements can be done by different entities. Now, as I said, they don't have to be housed in a corporation. So if we really want to stretch our minds, I think we have to go to that really basic issue and say, OK, how are we going to organize our economic activity anymore? Um, we, we may still have a few really huge corporations. But it may be that the other players in the economy, capital providers and individuals, may find that they simply don't have to be part of a huge organization anymore. And I don't know how far that'll go, but once you start thinking in those terms. We may not have corporations. The, the, the corporation, that's what I've been saying for a long time, that you know, the, the 21st century corporation may not be a corporation. You mentioned Tesla and its amazing valuation. Yeah. In fact, some of the things right. that you described, uh, you know, earnings per market value, yeah. Yeah. labor per market value. Is Tesla really the epitome of a friction-free company or is this just a rational exuberance? Well, th th look, there can certainly be both elements at play here because, yeah, clearly the, the market value they have is investors making a huge bet on the future. And as always, maybe they'll be right and maybe they'll be wrong. Um, so look, that's clearly an element in this. But at the same time, it is a business that has been designed from the ground up to take advantage of a friction-free economy. And that is kind of a fundamentally do, a new thing. That, so that's a lot where a lot of the expectations for the future come from. Whether they play out is another question. We're down to less than a minute right now, but yes. here you've got a very attentive audience. They're yes. here to learn about where the future of the state might be going and the role that they can play in it yeah. in, in less than a minute. Yes. What's the, the words of <laughs> wisdom that you would leave the audience with? Uh, well, well, you know, as far as the economic progress of the state is concerned, uh, first of all, all I've learned makes me extremely hopeful and optimistic. 
it is making sure that we are in a place to uh, take advantage of what's coming, which is absolutely technologically based, but it's those talents and abilities and skills combined with something we don't talk that much about, which is interpersonal skills, collaboration, creativity, that kind of thing. The places that can combine those most successfully are gonna be the big winners. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Colvin. Yeah.